Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Desert Gardening News, a Star Nursery podcast. I'm Madeline. And I'm Joey Lynn. We're so excited to have everyone back, and if you're brand new, then welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about some awesome things, but we'll introduce ourselves first. Um, I'm Madeline, and I'm a certified Nevada nurseryman. And I'm Joey Lynn. I'm Star Nursery Certified Arborist. And also, I am the other half of the Dr. Q's House Call team. Um, house, Dr. Q's House Calls is a service that we do where we come to your house um, and we provide any kind of advice or guidance that you have regarding insects, disease, plant health, irrigation, uh, any kind of questions that you have we are there to answer it. So uh, that's something that we really, really are proud to be able to offer to the homeowners here in the Las Vegas Valley. We have Dr. Q's experts in Utah as well that will go out and do house calls there too. So it's not just only in the Las Vegas Valley. And this month, it is the month of June, so it's National Rose Month and National Pollinator Month. We're going to start our conversation off today about our local pollinator populations and how we can better support them. Um, And then we'll be talking about a little bit what you guys need to know when harvesting your gardens this summer, and we'll end with a fun Q&A. So without further ado, we'll get started. Well, Madeline, of course... Madeline has picked another great topic for this month, and I'm excited to be able to uh, talk about it with everybody. We're going to talk about pollinators. Pollinators is probably one of the most interesting, exciting topics, and it covers everything, right? That without pollinators, we don't have flowers. You know, it's estimated that three-fourths of all blooming food source, flowers, vegetables need pollinators. That without pollinators, we wouldn't have food. We wouldn't have flowers. We just wouldn't have them. So it's really important that we know how to protect them. Mm -hmm. We need to know how to encourage them to be in our environment Mm -hmm. and we i think that the general public kind of thinks that it's such a broad thing i don't think people really realize that having a pollinator garden or something in their own backyard really does contribute to the environment and it really does there are a lot of things that we can plant that's going to encourage specific pollinators so I think first what we need to talk about is that a pollinator could be anything that gets the plant's pollen from one plant to the next. So that can be in the form of the world-renowned bee. Bees get the glory in all of this, don't they? Uh Um, Butterflies. There are moths. There are wasps. There are wasps. Ants Mm -hmm. are pollinators. Uh, Hummingbirds. We know the hummingbirds. Yeah. Bats are pollinators. Bats are pollinators. Anything that scurries or flies or uh, visits one plant and then goes to the next plant acts as a pollinator. Yeah, my definition here is a pollinator is anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower or the stamen to the female part of the same or another flower, the stigma. And the movement of pollen must occur for the plant to become fertilized and produce fruits, seeds, and young plants. So without that fertilization, really nothing can come of the plant. Mm -mm. You know, it'll just stay in the phase that it's at. It'll stay there, and it's just helpless without the pollinators. And you're right, there, there can be quite a few pollinators in your garden that you might not even know of. And... We're going to make you a little bit more aware of what to look out for and what you can do to help those populations that are currently present and what you can do to encourage new populations to visit your garden. And it's really simple. It really is. You know, it's just knowing what to do. But we've got you covered. Don't worry. We've got you covered. So we've got some pretty new scientific evidence of pollinators. And it's really exciting because it kind of debunks a lot of things that um, was previously known. And we're finding this out a lot 
a lot of archaeology is now kind of debunking what we've previously known about human history and the world history. So in March of this year of 2023, scientists discovered a 280 million year old fossil of an insect that was preserved with pollen on their bodies. So this is now this is known that the pollen was on the fossilized specimen. It is not known if the pollination was intentional or if that was like the main uh, function of what this little insect was doing. But the evidence shows that the insect had pollen on it, which could be assumed again. There's no way to prove it at the moment, but could be assumed that for, you know, 280 million years ago uh, that there were pollinators and that was their function. So that's some really exciting stuff. And um, on top of that, there are about 350,000 pollinator spe species in the world. Oh my gosh. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do we know if the insect that they found is a species that is still in existence today? Um, so I didn't see the exact species on the article that I read. Um, this was from Science Daily, and it was relatively new information. But the picture that they used looked kind of like like a gnat almost, yeah. like just very, very small. And it wasn't like it was a bee. It wasn't like a butterfly. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't anything like that. So it just was very, very small organism that with an exoskeleton, definitely for sure. But Wow, I think it's exciting. I think that anything that we can learn from our past to help us, you know, you think about fossils and you think about dinosaurs mm -hmm. going extinct and how our environment and ecosystem plays a very, very big role in how fragile our oh, yeah. society is and our humanity, that anything that we can learn from the fall of previous prehistoric is going to help us in the long run i know there's and so much to learn and the secrets of the universe are kind of already out there like we're just we are just kind of dissecting what's already you know what we're, what's available to us to then figure out the secrets of the universe and then that way we can better preserve our planet and right. that is the priority and that is what our whole mission here is to do is just to support the populations that we can that way we can be here longer and other species can as well and we each can contribute so so we know that um our pollinators and our plants they've had a relationship that is over 100 million years old um, and how they benefit each other. Before pollinators though, some plants relied on the wind and the rain um, to be able to move that pollen to each other so that they could um, fertilize and others could pollinate themselves, um, other plants. And now um, angiosperms, um, flowering plants have evolved to attract other living things to do the work of pollinating for them, um, which is why their colors are so vibrant. They're trying to get everyone's attention. It's, it's very deliberate in what they're trying to do. And plants are lazy, as we know. So <laughs> they would like our, our our species and other pollinator species to do the work for them, totally understandable. Um, and today you're right, over three quarters of flowering plants need an animal pollinator to reproduce. So it's more important than ever that we are educating everybody on pollinators and how beneficial they are. We're educating them um, on how to support them as well. So did you know that one of the most attractive colors to pollinators is purple? Purple? Mm -hmm. So you've only heard of red. No, purple. Purple, uh, purples and blues, they are a phenomenal attractor of pollinators. And it's really great. We have available, if anybody wanted to email me um, at uh, housecalls at starnursery.com, and I can give you a list of pollinator plants and it is done by color now the variety of color is from yellows into reds and burgundies and then purples and um it can you can plant flowers you can plant trees trees are a great pollinator um we have some local native 
trees and I can read them to you right now like the Joshua tree the Joshua hey. tree is a great pollinator um, the creosote that is our mm -hmm. native that is a yellow flower mm -hmm. and the yellow the, the thing about the color yellow in the desert is it actually is very resilient to the desert sun and heat so that's why you'll see a lot of colors in the desert that the yellow it's just a really reliable uh, flowering color mm. so things like yellow bells the tacoma bells out here lantana lantana they do the they perform the absolute best they put on the biggest show of flowers and it's typically yellow that is going to be the best but um we have also our desert willows the cat's claw acacia when you think of the acacia trees or even the palo verdes they're yellow but uh there's lots and lots of what here do i have that's um oh the beaver tail cactus that puts on yeah. the the pink flowers uh so we have lots of resources for you guys if you go to starnursery.com and you go to our star notes, we have a publication there for plants that attract butterflies and bees mm -hmm. and pollinators. So the information is out there. You can Google it as well. You can look for uh, websites with your native plants mm -hmm. that promote uh, pollinators. And it's just really exciting. As always, we are um, going to be encouraging everybody to plant native, and this is because we have a lot of native pollinator species, and um, to better support them, you want to be able to provide them with the plant that best suits them. Um, and right here, we've got a fun little infographic. It's the Nevada Bee Identification Guide. Um, there's been a lot of contributors to make this list. We've got the Museum of Natural History, as well as Nevada Bugs and Pollinators, or Nevada Bugs and Butterflies, my bad. Um, but right here, we can see a lot of the bees that you're going to see in our local communities. Um, this can be carpenter bees, which are those big, big bees that you are uh, very loud, very, very loud. And you might have the first instinct to swat them away because they're a little bit intimidating because they're so big. Um, but these are harmless and you don't need to swat away any bee bees. Don't, don't hurt them, please. But um, that's one example of a native bee that you might find. Bumblebees, of course, and honeybees. And um, these are going to be d doing the majority of this pollinator work are these cute little honeybees on their daily adventure to fetch as much pollen as possible to bring back to their cute little um, hives. I learned, I learned something so cute and it was a series of pictures of bumblebees that they go from flower to flower, but they get a little tired and they take naps inside of the flowers. <laughs> and so their little pollen butts are just kind of just sitting out of the flower. It's the cutest thing. If you guys have time to look that up, just look up like, bees asleep in flowers and it's the cutest thing ever they're you know they're relatively harmless and um it's just important that we recognize them as contributors to our food source and how much work that they're putting in so we need to put in equal work to protect them and i think we have to remember that they instinctively know what their job is mm -hmm. they don't really care about what we're doing unless we're in their path and it happens that we are in their way they're doing their job they're not thinking about us at all so when i remember raising babies and every you, the babies would freak out oh yeah that the bees were around and i would say they're doing their job they won't want nothing to do with you just stay out of their way and don't disturb them now during house calls we get a lot of house calls where there's a lot of bee activity and um i've gone to many properties and they've actually had a hive somewhere because they didn't realize they were putting out sugar water or they were putting out their humming bee bird feeders and it was too high of concentrate of sugar content in the water if you're putting out something to feed you're you're making your own nectar and you're having bees that are um visiting your 
feeders often most likely it's because you have your sugar content too high and that is a big key we don't want to be feeding our bees we want our bees to go and get the nectar yeah. it just like every other species in the world they're going to take the easy way out and they're going to be lazy about it mm -hmm. so if you have a lot of bee activity and you have an aggressive bee that gets easily distracted and comes after you, then that is an alert that it could be an Africanized nest or population somewhere around. In our education that we learn about the bees, most likely any of that honeybee yeah is africanized yeah. and can we talk about a little bit what does it mean to be an africanized bee and what is the difference well it is a species of bee that has integrated into the honeybee and they find their way in they aggressively take over yes. that hive and the rest of the the original hive kind of dies off but we're to expect that every hive has yes. have been in, integrated it, with an Africanized bee. So, but we're not to be afraid of it. Yeah. What we need to know is we need to know the warning signs. And the warning signs are that if you have an aggressive bee, you're, you are tending to your garden or you, your trees are in full bloom and you have a bee or a group of bees that won't let you approach or they get out of line and they come mm -hmm. and they come to you and they're real sporadic. Yeah. That is sign that it's a possible possibility that wherever that hive is, that it's been Africanized. Now, the bees have a scout that goes out first. Right. That scout finds where the fields are or where their next nectar is, goes back to the hive, communicates with the hive where they're going to get the pollen, and then they come out. So what we're learning is a lot of the damage that happens is going when they go back to the hive. Mm -hmm. So it's not that bee. It's where the bees hive is. And if you could find that now, it could be miles away. Mm -hmm. So just because you have it doesn't mean that you have a hive in your backyard. But there are ways to tell you can follow the bee. I've been I did a house call where there was a huge bee hive in a ash tree on the front yard right above the walkway and the homeowner said oh well I don't want to do anything because I don't want to bother the the hive and I said but the damage that will be done if that hive falls and it happens to be Africanized it has to be handled if you know you have a hive you really need to ha call some bee people out and have it properly removed it's not anything that you should do yourself you should contact some professionals to come and do that but uh, we do everything possible to not disturb them let them do their job and they will not have any concern with you at all and same with the wasps you could potentially find a wasp um, nest somewhere in your landscape don't try and deal with it yourself definitely call a professional i do not want to leave this episode without talking about the sweet cutter bee mm. uh Here's at this. this time right now with your lovely lovely rose bushes or anything that's putting on new fresh tender leaves like bougainvillea um our Texas Mountain Laurel has a really sweet leaf. You'll see the cutter bee comes and cuts out a half circle. It's almost a perfect little circle. And then what they do, this it's a female. She takes that back to the nest and her nest is a um, maybe a hole in a cinder block wall, a little crack, a crevice. And she then lays her eggs and she only has a life cycle of maybe one or two sets of offspring and then she dies so mm -hmm. she'll never do enough to uh just to kill the plant it just doesn't look appealing sometimes but if you can avoid 
putting any insects insecticides or any deterrents on those plants and let her just cut away uh you're going to be helping with a great pollinator a, a native pollinator and that is the cutter bee we we like her a lot i tell people to just kind of let her be she's a good mama <laughs> yeah bees are just incredible little creatures and they are the unsung heroes of agriculture i think it's every every third bite of food that you take is mm -hmm. directly affiliated with a bee that worked hard for you to eat that bite of food. So it's really important that we do everything that we can for our bee populations. In addition to bee populations, it's really important to consider our butterflies. Yes. I know that the, no pun intended, the buzz word <laughs> is our monarchs and our monarch butterflies. The monarchs, they're very picky. And it's important that we understand what pollinators are picky and what pollinators are not picky. And I'll let you continue to talk a little bit why our monarch butterflies, as beautiful as they are, are very picky. Well, you bring out a good point. What you're seeing from May to April is actually scouts. They're coming and they're scouting out milkweed. So milkweed, that is the only plant that the larvae can actually eat that's what they eat they will eat the whole plant right um and so the female fertile monarchs so there's a scout that comes out and then the fertile females will come they will find those plants lay their eggs on those plants so you can start seeing monarchs as early as may um the best thing that you can do for the monarchs is to know what milkweeds are native and the reason that that is important and what i've learned is this is a very controversial conversation that we're having because there are some purists that will never ever recommend that you plant another type of milkweed there are some tropical milkweeds that don't go dormant or th meaning they they're not deciduous they're evergreens some of the problem with that and the thought is is if the plant doesn't go dormant then any of the bacteria or any diseases will stay on the plant so when we talk about diseases in plants deciduous plants have the ability to go dormant and shut down and in those cold weather seasons, they're allowed to rest in anything that's feeding off of actively growing leaf parts. Then that gets to stay and it just multiplies. So, I, I, and if I'm not mistaken, and I could be mistaken, the tropical is one that's very controversial to plant because it doesn't go dormant. It is um, able to withstand lots of temperature zones and uh, a lot of purists believe that this, the monarchs will pick up something and take it on their migration and actually transfer diseases onto other milkweeds. So it oh, is wow. very, very important. Now I have, there's several um, na uh, local um, groups right. that support monarchs. University of Nevada Cooperative Extension has a milkweed monarch program and they have a milkweed garden and it's about 10 years old right now. Wow. And they actually have, they uh, seen through the migration after the monarchs already are leaving that other monarchs will come in wow. and be on their milkweed as they go and it is really an exciting the co the cooperative extension actually gives out the best recommended native milkweed seed which you, is you brought those with i you brought today. them yes which is the rush milkweed and these seeds that you can get from the cooperative extension are actually from their plants they do not have a very long viable life just like shelf life mm -hmm. okay so the sooner that the the 
seed that you get, you want to put it in the ground when you get it. And you really want to germinate these inside. Uh, I spoke with Anne Marie over at the Cooperative Extension. She's an amazing uh, woman and she does all kinds of tests on when she plants her seeds indoors, when she sets them out. She's just a load of information, very available. All this information is available to you. Just reach out to uh, the University Cooperative Extension and we'll put the information up there for you. Um, And it's just brilliant. She's just brilliant. The whole program is amazing. Um, Also with the Southern Nevada Milkweed Project, they have listed in here six different milkweed plants. Uh, Now, availability is always a big deal. So Star Nursery gets milkweed in, in four inch. We are limited when we get them due to our grower releasing them. Right. But once we get them and they go real quick, they do. so make sure you keep your eye out for the rush. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the desert milkweed uh, is one that we sell. The um, I think it's the yellow. What, oh, it's right here. The narrow leaf milkweed we sell in seed through botanical interests the showy milkweed that is on the southern nevada milkweed projects handout i have here we sell that as well those are the two that we will have in the botanical interest desert milkweed and rush milkweed that you can get seeds from the cooperative extension they're local and then the final resource that i have is the southwest monarch study now this study covers the arizona the california colorado the new mexico and utah so all of southern nevada so if you're listening in any of those uh, markets you can go to swmonarchs.org and And um, do your part to plant a milkweed and keep the population migrating and producing. And there's a couple other things I just wanted to touch on Um, as we're in this season and, uh, you know, the monarchs are reproducing. It's important to see what is an egg on your plant and what is an aphid. Um, An aphid is going to be yellowish in color. You'll see them move around on your plants versus if you see an egg, it's just going to be a tiny little white dot don't mess with the egg as soon as that egg is gone you will not be seeing a little larva or a little monarch caterpillar in the future the other thing um a lot of the time monarch caterpillars and skeletonizers are kind of very similar looking and um you might be using bt on a monarch caterpillar and accidentally killing that future monarch so it's important to know um although they may look very similar with the striping um the monarch is going to have kind of the horns on either side of the ends versus the skeletonizer caterpillar is not going to have any of these little horns on their heads so you mentioned bt yes. let me tell the, the everybody what bt is bt is actual biological warfare it's an insecticide <laughs> yes. but it is a natural biological chemical yes it is a it's actually bt worm killer and it's actually bacillus thuringiensis okay it is a bacteria that is sprayed on the plant and what it does is it sits on the leafy parts and it when the caterpillar chomps on it it puts this bacteria in their belly and they kind of get dehydrated because they don't eat because they basically get a belly ache and they fall off the plant and die so that's why it's important it is a topical spray and it is recommended because there are other caterpillars there are other moths there are things that will take out uh Things like our Texas Mountain Laurel. Yeah. You will come out your tomato your horn, worms. They will eat, but we from and that's completely fine to use them. The key is being aware of if you have milkweed in your yard and you are a habitat for monarchs, 
then we want to avoid using it. Um, it all caterpillars will end up in some form of a flying moth or a butterfly. So we want to use it only when necessary, mm -hmm. only when our harvest is in danger. So the what we do to keep our plants and our vegetables free from insects, your first approach is always going to be go out and hose down mm -hmm. and wash the leaves off of your plants. Um, that should be something that we always do first thing in preventing any insects or um, even um, any kind of fungus or bacteria or anything is making sure that the quality of the environment around the plant is conducive to a healthy plant. A healthy plant is going to be able to fight off insects and disease. So it's this whole perfect little picture that we have to kind of learn how to work. And BT in itself is not bad. It is used in agriculture. It is used in um, the growing of our corn. Um, there's that's why if you stick GMO, you know, no, there's been no genetic modification at all. You won't have things like BT that have been used. But if you get corn off of out of the grocery store, most likely BT has been used and it, it has absolutely no harm to us. It's only towards this one species of caterpillar. Um, there's also several strands of bacillus that is used in organic gardening for things like fungus gnats, um, even mosquitoes. So it is common to have bacillus used, right. but BT is what we're talking about in terms of butterflies and monarchs. If you have a beautiful butterfly garden and you don't have any edibles and you don't have anything that is being affected by caterpillars they're not eating them down in the middle of the night then you would never use that you don't need to use that just let the process of from egg to butterfly happen mm -hmm. in your yard and uh, be a safe habitat for that so um we're talking about habitat now we all have the ability to become a certified wildlife habitat. And did you just say we can get <laughs> certified certified to be a national wildlife habitat? This is the most exciting thing that I I have ever heard. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you maybe have already started this process of getting this certification, but if you haven't, it's really something to look into. If you've already got a garden and you're dedicated to that garden and you are dedicated to caring for it, it's not gonna be too much to um, qualify for this certification. And you get a sign. You do. You get, you a, get sign a sign to put in your yard that and says that you are a certified wildlife habitat. And limited bragging rights and you can tell all your friends and your grandma will love you forever <laughs> um so you get a personalized um certificate you get a one-year membership um in the national wildlife federation and subscription to national wildlife magazine um 10 percent off the wildlife federation catalog and merchandise uh you get the e-newsletter and um, the exclusive option to purchase attractive garden signs um, designating your garden as a certified wildlife habitat. Um, and there are a few things that you need to um, accomplish to be certified and the requirements include the food source, water source, and um, cover places for um, the young to be raised within your garden and your uh, sustainable practices. So it says a balanced certified wildlife habitat supports the above elements with goal of 50 to 70 percent native plants mm -hmm. that provide multi-season bloom and are free of neonis. Uh, Neo, it's your yard has to be free of neonicotinoids. And do you know what that is? Actually, it. The, that's a systemic insecticide that is uh, resembling of nicotine. Really? Yes. So I didn't even know this yeah, until you sent me this. Well, uh, so you, can, there, you cannot you, have neonicotinoids 
in your garden. If you do, you do not qualify for the national certified wildlife habitat. But insecticides have labels. This is one thing that I really want everybody to understand. It is important that you read your label for insecticide or even an herbicide. All over the counter or insecticides and herbicides that are labeled for retail have a pretty safe warning, but nothing is free from consequences. Nothing is benign. Okay, the only benign thing that you can do is, like I mentioned before, go out, hose your plant down before anything. You start to see some insects that or some webbing or some dust build up. Keeping a clean environment for your plants is really going to help. So don't be afraid of us right now using these fancy scientific terms Everything has a warning on it. Uh, it is law that they every label have a B warning on it. Yes. That it specifically tells you that this is going to adversely affect a bee population. Or and it's uh, this, it's this use of insecticides that is also contributing to these declining populations and improper uses of the insecticide yes oh and proper uses and over usage Mm -hmm. and i mean a lot of historically what has been done in agriculture is improper use with insecticides herbicides that have caused so many climate problems that we are now battling today and it is a trickling effect Mm -hmm. and that is why i mean of course you need to use the right product for your plant when you're trying to create a result of whatever it is Um, but it's important especially if you are wanting to support these populations to avoid any of um, any of these insecticides that are going to harm the populations which include anything that it has uh, neonicotinoids in it Mm -hmm. because that does contribute to the decline. One thing that you can do, I know May has just left us, but did you know that May is considered no mow May? No mow May? No mow May. I'm sorry. I've never even heard of no mow May. Yes. So the idea is to get ready for summer Uh and to encourage the population one single thing that you can do is don't mow for the month of may really and that way the pollinators will come in and they all of the insects and stuff like that that are good and the the bees will come in and be in your yard if you have a lawn don't mow the month of may interesting and taking that one step further to protect We now are learning not to use any herbicide on the cracks and crevices in all your hardscaping. That is one way to help preserve some habitat. If you do need to remove it, just get in with a screwdriver, do the hard labor, get on your hands and knees and dig out the weed versus using a herbicide during this very, very busy pollinating month and season so while everything is really super active go in and hand pull the weeds versus using an herbicide and um, that way you don't leave any chemical residue behind that could be hurtful yeah i've never heard of no mo may yeah no mo may i'm sorry that we didn't get you guys that information last month but yeah. hopefully you can hold on to that for next year that's right Well, that's going to be all for our pollinator topic. I know that we only just touched the surface of pollinators, but I really hope that this was a good overview, especially it's National Pollinator Month, so we couldn't just leave you guys in the dark of what you need to know. Um, But we will be touching back on pollinators and be giving you guys tips and tricks throughout the year. Um, This won't be the last we talk about it. This is only just the beginning. So today we are going to be talking a little bit about um, what to expect as you're harvesting your garden. If you are listening to this podcast, you know, more than likely you have a garden. Hopefully we were able to convince that um, of you to do earlier this year in one of our previous episodes. But yeah, if you're a new gardener, you might have a lot of questions about 
you know, harvesting your plants, protecting your plants during your harvest, protecting your soils, um, providing nutrients to your soils. So um, there's a lot of questions that we hope we can answer for you today. Um, I'm going to start off by bringing up the question, what can you be looking for or how do you know your plant is ready to be harvested? Um, and what, what are the expectations going into harvesting these these plants? Well, that's a really good question. And everybody is so concerned about, got to get this done before the heat. I think that that's why June, it's on our minds. We got to harvest because the, the high temperatures are coming. We know they're going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And um, the most important thing to know, first of all, is what the expectation is of that plant. If you planted um, eggplant, know which eggplant you planted and what the expected size is. So if you planted a small eggplant, not the giant globe, then we're only looking at about an inch to four inches for an eggplant. A Japanese eggplant is going to be very long and slender. So we go back to knowing what it is that we planted and what the expectation of that plant is. So if it is to be a one inch fruit. And we know that like strawberries, strawberries, we know we are looking for a color. Um, some strawberries are pink in color. Some are red. So know the product that you have. And mother nature has a wonderful way of releasing her fruit when they're ready. You want to just approach the plant give a nice little twist depending on what it is. Uh, citrus are really, really hard to get off. Um, they, they'll, they'll take a real big twist. So it's all about temperature and exposure for citrus as well. If you've made it through and you still have citrus on your plants, I doubt that, but some citrus are ever bearing. Mm -hmm. They are so, uh, they do such a great job in, uh, producing fruit and flowers that they're considered ever bearing. So you want to know the consistency of the fruit in that season. And if you've got a really, really small and it doesn't come off the plant, then it's not ready yet. Tomatoes, we're going to look for color on tomatoes and we're going to look for sun exposure. That's going to be the biggest thing with tomatoes. Tomatoes that are expected to be large, like beef steak, they're going to crack and possibly have a burnt, scarring, sun scald on one side. Those fruit are still good to eat. We're so accustomed to having uh, grocery store quality fruits and vegetables that we tend to uh, take things off of the vine too quickly because they don't look good. Um, a really, really ripe cantaloupe, the netting, that's what they call that outer um, texture is netting. The netting is going to be very, very open and it's going to be, um, it may have a flat side on it and that's okay. But for cantaloupe and you just give a little twist and it should come off the vine pretty easily. Watermelon, to know when watermelon is ready, watermelon is going to be for its size, very heavy. Watermelon will also have a lack of color on the bottom. So don't go out to your watermelon, turn your watermelon and expect to rotate it like a suntan. It doesn't work that way for <laughs> watermelon. <laughs> that bottom side will be void of color because mm -hmm. it hasn't seen the sun and it will be flat. There's no way to kind of fix that. Um, when the melons or cantaloupe or the, the gourds are young, um, if we get them off the ground, we have a better ability to kind of turn them and they be a 360 degree fruit. Um, radishes. Radishes are best when they're small. So if you're waiting for a very, very big, even with the daikon, they're expected to be larger. But the longer that they stay in our high alkaline soil, they tend to get bitter and spicier and sharper. Now, if that's what you like, go for it. Um, but um, beets, any of those root vegetables, once you start seeing that 
that root kind of take that round at the top of the soil, you're ready to go. Um, the other thing is our bunching onions. You can take them all out continue to take the whole onion out or you can just use the cutting all of all of that is um up to your taste how you want to use that your culinary expertise that's right <laughs> peaches they're probably ready mm-hmm. about now uh another good indicator in uh the natural world is when you start seeing heavy bird activity in all of your tree um fruits and even some of your lower fruits and vegetables birds know they've got a a good palate too so at this what about time rabbit if, if oh. a rabbit population is present is that you, an indicator? if you have a rabbit population you may not have get anything at all because they're there <laughs> they, from the beginning they might just eat it all they just might eat can. the whole thing but so bird netting right now is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the other thing to know is if you did not thin your fruit. So right now you may go out to your um, apples or your uh, pears or nectarines um, or your plums as well. And you may need to thin yeah. Without thinning early on, you may have fruit that doesn't get the opportunity to put on that fleshy, fleshy uh, fruit part that we like. And it's all stone inside. So your stone fruits, they that stone is the size it's genetically made to be. That's not going to vary in the the fruit that's on the tree. If we did not thin early on, that pit will always be the size that that pit was genetically made to be. It's not going to ever be smaller because it didn't have space. Do you follow what I'm saying? So if you have a small peach Mm -hmm. and it's been crammed in the tree because we were afraid to thin, then we didn't have time for the flesh part of the fruit to grow and that will be stunted and you may always have a small fruit so going and getting in the tree kind of giving a little twist uh is is when that tree releases it most likely is when it's ready so getting bird netting there to protect from the birds getting will give you some more time on the plant um and then what else can we think about that would be when we talk about the stone fruit, yes, is June potentially the time that you're going to be seeing a lot of fruit drop? Does that mean yes. it's well, premature? Now, yeah, that's called June drop. Okay. And June drop happens because of winds, our, our dry summer winds. That connection that the that the fruit has to the tree is really fragile. Mm-hmm. And it takes a lot of nutrients water uh, to keep that fruit on there and that fruit it gets really really heavy so june drop is a real thing and when the winds come in that dry air if we don't have enough moisture in the soil remember what happens on the top of the tree and the health and quality of the top of the tree is directly related to the quality that is in the soil Mm -hmm. and what the root system is doing. So if we know we have a lot of dry summer winds coming, then we need to make sure we, our irrigation is on its a game. And we though right prior to that, give a good, nice, long, deep irrigation to help, uh, fight against a June drop. And yes, it is a really, really true thing that happens so just the best way to prevent it is irrigation then irrigation and also early on protection of that connection from flower to fruit so we have what's called a blossom set it's by um it's a tomato blossom set but really it's calcium so when a tree does not ever have its fruit set from flowering we can go back and think about why typically if it's a nutrient deficiency it's due to a calcium deficiency 
And we can supplement that with a foliar spray. And Bonide makes a product and it's called Tomato Blossom Set. Now, we have done the, we are supposed to always stick to labels, right? For the consumer. It is what the label says. And it specializes in tomatoes and pepper, that family of vegetable. Um, I know I've had customers that have used it for their citrus and they've been very successful with it. Um, again, that is all personal scientific experiment that some people are very, very successful. Uh, but protecting that flower and making sure that that flower connection to plant turns into the fruit is the most important thing. You do that with nutrients in the soil, irrigation, uh, supplemental spray of the blossom set, the calcium, and you should have a really good, a good bumper crop. Now, let's say you've just harvested from your garden. Mm -hmm. And um, are you, for most plants, are you expecting multiple harvests? Yes, we can. And actually, I'm glad you brought this up because things like our tomato and our pepper plants, we're used to treating them like an annual. An annual means that we one one season. OK, it, it actually is a little bit more technical than that. It's the seed coming to bloom and then the bloom, you know, that seed, has, that plant has spent its life creating yeah. this seed and then it dies. But in terms of one season use, we tend to do that. What we're learning is the tomatoes and peppers that are in the ground now that you put in in spring we may we had a late spring so your crop might be really really sparse right now get protection on those plants cover them with uh, some kind of sun protection. It could be a 50% or 35 to 50% sunscreen. It could be burlap. It could be um, a larger plant where it's just breaking up that afternoon sun, that summer afternoon sun. Get those plants to fall and you will have a fabulous fall harvest. Plants like um, your fruit trees, your deciduous fruit trees. Right now, after you harvest, the only thing that you're going to do right now is you're going to be very careful in not breaking any branches now when you harvest. Then come back, put a nice mulch on the ground. You could even do a light fertilizing right now. You could use Dr. Q's uh, Stardust, it's our new organic starter fertilizer. You can come and use that right now, which is a nice balanced fertilizer because the plant is still working. It's still functioning, right? Until those leaves come off, that plant is still uh, processing nutrients and, and um, from the soil. So we want to encourage good, healthy root growth right now, because the more that you can encourage that root growth, the better that plant's going to do during the winter season. Now, the trees that go dormant love being cold. As a matter of fact, uh, they, the longer the cold for some, the better the product is going to be. So if we can get them to go into dormancy and have a really healthy root system, meaning they were never lacking anything. If we have anything in the season that was lacking and we carry it into the next, then that product, whether it's a flower, fruit, vegetable, anything is going to suffer. It's yeah. going to be less quality the next season. So another thing that you can do is add like worm gold plus. That is a great compost that's got a worm colony so that that when we integrate a worm colony, those decomposers are going and they're aerating the soil and there's constant microbes and everything that's benefiting these root systems. So there's a lot that you can do. The only thing that you really wouldn't do anything for right now is herbs. It's too hot. All herbs are really, really tender, green, leafy products. And those are so tender that we really don't want to be doing any fertilizing right now for them. On the topic of fertilization, we would just recommend everything be fertilized potentially um, after harvest other than the herbs. Correct. So right now 
you can use, like I said, a great gentle starter fertilizer. Uh, Dr. Q's Stardust is a new organic Omri listed. We're very, very proud of it. It's going to be a great amendment to the soil. Add your Dr. Q's pay dirt. If these plants are in the ground, the pay dirt is what we, it's a great mulch and uh, a great organic matter that we're adding. So in the summer, when we have our high temperatures and we're adding extra water to our soils because we're, uh, it's so dry, the water has high pH, our soil, it pulls out all the salts, it becomes higher in alkaline. And so adding organic matter to our soil is, is what's going to decompose and lower the pH. Getting that root system in an optimal situation as we go into July, and it, we're preparing for our extreme temperatures, the better you're going to be able to preserve that plant and get it to its next season. I think that's going to be it for our little harvest portion. And I hope you all have had a great harvest and are continuing to have a great harvest. And we'll probably be talking a little bit more about harvesting in the fall. So this isn't the end of the conversation. No. Um, again, just the beginning. Um, and now we're just going to end with a fun little quiz portion. And we're just going to have a good time. And we're going to end the podcast off like that. So for the last portion of our episode today, we're going to do a little Q&A with our expert, and we're going to just ask her some questions and see if she can get the right answer. Oh, boy. All right. We've only got three questions okay. today. So the first thing I'm going to tell you the definition, and you're going to give me um, the, the word that I'm thinking of. So when a temperature is... When temperatures are hot enough for an extended period of time or a sufficient amount of time that they start to cause irreversible damage to a, the plant or the plant functions, um, what is that termed as um, commonly in the in the garden world? Well, it's very well known here and it's called the heat stress. Yes. So if you ever stumble upon that term, um, heat stress, it is describing when temperatures are so hot for such a period of time that they do start to cause damage to the plant and their function. But there are a couple ways that you can um, deter heat stress and avoid it and prevent it. It's going to be to choose the most heat tolerant plants that you can. We're dealing with 100 degree plus weather mm -hmm. for long periods of time. So you, the best bet that you're going to have with your plants in your landscape to avoid heat stress is just choosing the right plant from, from the start. Um, and you can go to the nursery and check out our desert natives and our desert, um, our desert plant section. And those are going to be the best, the best plants to avoid, um, heat stress. And our plant library, we have on our plant library, we have desert accents, uh, as a subcategory where we have all of the plants there and pictures and descriptions and even water needs. And just because it says desert on it, read the description to make mm -hmm. sure that it suits your specific exposure. Yeah. And that means how many hours in the full sun, fully exposed it takes in its day. So mm -hmm. make sure you do your research. It's really, really a great uh, time to plan and um, get on our website. We have lots of resources there to help. Mm -hmm. And the other recommendation to prevent heat stress in your landscape is to potentially add some um, shade cloth or planting it somewhere near another plant that's going to or another um, area of your garden that's going to break up the sun and that way you can get some afternoon shade and it won't be as harsh on the plant and you can avoid some of the heat stress that a lot of the plants are probably experiencing right now in our landscapes. All right. Are you ready for the second okay, question? Okay, that was good. That was easy. I got that one you right. Did. Okay. <laughs> so, um, true or false, some species of bees are attracted to salt in human sweat. Well, I know it sure does seem like that. It is. So, um, it is true. It seems like, it, so you're saying that there is, there is a bee 
There are bees. Um, they're actually, I think they're called sweat bees. And they are attracted to salt in human sweat. So if you are sweating profusely and the bees just won't leave you alone. Um, Get out of the garden. Yeah, just <laughs> just leave because they're they're coming after you because they're they're attracted to your sweat. So it's so really this may be that it's not a you know how they say bees sense fear. So um, it's not that they sense the fear, they sweating. the sweat that happens. So I know. the chemical response by sweating because you're afraid, that is really phenomenal. That's a good one, Madeline. I like that. One. You, that's great. <laughs> and um, the sweat bees, they're also on that pollinate or on that bee identification guide that we talked about so earlier. Native. Yeah, so you will see them, and they are kind of their own little category. Wow. Um, and it, they're really interesting, and because it's National Pollinator Month, definitely head over to um, that little website and find that PDF and do your research on that guide and get to know our native bee populations okay. a little better. But that's just one of them that you can expect to find. And our last question of the day um, is going to be, what is America's national flower? Oh, I don't know. I, I can't believe I don't know that. I, I really can't believe I don't know that. I don't know that. Okay, it's okay. I'm admitting I don't know it. Go. It's okay. Um, it's only been our national flower since 1986 when President Ronald oh, Reagan. Okay, I know what it is then. You do? It's a rose. Yeah. I got it right. You it did. wasn't until you said Ronald Reagan yeah, so and the date. Ronald Reagan on November 20th declared the rose the national flower of the USA in a special ceremony in the White House Rose Garden. Um, the flower is commonly known as the rose. It's from the rose family, as most of you guys know. Um, and it is our floral emblem. Which I is did really not cool. know that. That's really cool. And um, the president of the United States, States is authorized um, to declare this fact. So it is kind of, and maybe it'll change in the future, but for, for now, right now, it's proclaimed that it is the rose and it is National Rose Month. So make sure to tend to your roses. Wow. And get to know your roses because they're beautiful and wonderful. Yes. Yeah. I love the roses and they're they all need over. a little work in TLC. They're hard, but they're worth it. It's really worth it. Oh yeah. And they're And you, we can grow gorgeous. beautiful roses here. Yeah. Beautiful. They do most of the work anyways. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's gonna be it for today, guys. Wow, that was a good one. If you're still with us, um, we hope that you learned a lot. I know that we learned a lot. Absolutely. We always learn a lot. <laughs> And it's been so much fun. Um, we have our podcast episodes come out every single month and we're discussing new topics. We have um, new guests. So make sure to tune in every month to learn something about your garden and about your Southwest environment. Um, if you want to stay up to date with everything going on at Star Nursery, you can follow our social media. We are on Facebook at Star Nursery, Instagram at Star Nursery LV. And we're also on Twitter at Star Nursery. And you can find um, our blog posts online and we'll update update you guys all about the newest in gardening and how to care for your garden throughout the year. Well, thank you again for joining us and we'll see you guys back here next month. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye.